What's up, everybody? Let me start by saying it is an absolute honor and pleasure to be here today. <sighs> you know, it came out of nowhere, but I am grateful, and I was prepared, because this is what I really love to do. And, you know, for these high school or, and college students out there, you know, the, the majority that are really, really struggling, um, you know, it, it wasn't too long ago that I was in their shoes when I was at the University of Virginia, only a short 15 years ago. So to now be able to come back and share much of what I've learned throughout my, my roller coaster of a journey to the big leagues for close to a decade, but, but roller coaster of a journey both on and off the field, this is truly, truly what I'm so passionate about and what I love to do and really why when I retired in 2020 from playing, I went right into this work because I saw how it transformed my life and I knew if I could take all of that and take what I like to call you know, this gauntlet that I went through, because I promise you anything, just about everything you can imagine on the mental side of the game of life and athletics, uh, mental side and physical side, I've been there. Mentally, anxiety, fear, worry, doubt, stress, depression. I've experienced it all. And on the physical side, as Tyler said, so I got hit a lot when I played. I was nicknamed La Pinata. And um, I think three years, I led the league in getting hit. Um, so seven surgeries. I've had a lot of physical pain, too. So when it comes to mentally and physically, um, I've experienced a lot of pain. And, and while it felt like a gauntlet going through it, I truly am so grateful because it blessed me with the wisdom and the experience and the platform to build a system, a system that I call Major League Mindset, that like Tyler said, the sole mission of it is to empower others with a mindset that helps them consistently show up as that best version of themselves, whether it's an athlete on the field or off the field. And, and really, I stress off the field because I firmly believe the, the same mental skills, tools, character, and overall mindset that's going to help individuals or really athletes perform at a high level on the field, well, those same skills, tools, character, and overall mindset is what's going to help them perform uh, at a high level, not just on the field, but in life. And that's what this is all about. Give them this mindset to do that, and most importantly, so they can enjoy the process. So they can enjoy the process, whether it's their playing or how they're going about life, enjoy the process. That's what it's all about. So let me give you a little rundown of what we're gonna go over today. First, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my story, my background, and really what brought me here. I like to call it my journey of adversity. Um, and then ask you guys, Two simple but very important questions, followed by a quick story of two different players, but we, it could easily be people. And then I'm going to go into the four principles, four principles that completely transform my life, and I truly and I strongly, strongly believe for anyone out there, if, if, we can, if you can apply them, it, it can definitely take thing, help you take everything to a whole other level, help you or someone you love do that as well. Um, and, and when I really learned these, it, it helped me so much. And that's why when I retired, I was like, this is what I got to do. I was blessed with this. Now I got to give it back. Okay. Um, so we will go into those four principles and four principles that I firmly believe. You apply them, you strengthen your mind, develop these mental skills and tools. What happens is you have higher highs and higher lows because we are all human beings. We are all going to have lows. But if we can build that scaffolding, build that foundation, build that mindset and have the mental skills and tools to handle the inevitable adversity that's going to come all our way, our lows are going to be higher and our highs will be higher and then something beautiful happens. Who you are or who you were at your best, who you used to be at your best, that becomes your baseline. And then once we get there, we just continue to level up. Um, so I really cannot emphasize enough um, these four principles that we're going to go over. It's what got me through my, my darkest of moments. Um, and like I said, so grateful that I did go through that because now I have what it takes um, to give to other people to help them out. Just like a lot of people helped me out along, uh, along my journey. Um, so first, a little background on myself. So I'm gonna start in high school. And this is where, where it all started. I like to think that I was a, my first three years, Herndon High School in Northern Virginia, I was a, uh, I like to call it a perfectionist with a fixed mindset and no identity. A perfectionist with a fixed mindset and no identity. Those first three years in high school, on and off the field, struggled mightily. And it was because of that, that eventually heading into senior year, I finally got the courage to talk to a coach 
and talk to him about how I'm struggling mentally with all this. So he gave me a couple books to read. And back in 2004, this stuff wasn't talked about a whole lot. But I read these books, literally took it to heart and applied it. And I felt like I went out that senior year. And not just playing, but just going through school with relationships, at home with family. It was like I was a whole new person. Had more self-awareness, better routines, had, had tools and, and really more discipline um, to consistently just show up at my best no matter what I was doing in life. So I went out there senior year. I was given this key that I like to call my mindset, the key that just unlocked the other 20 to 30% of potential that I thought was just sitting inside of me. And going into senior year, I had zero scholarships, zero colleges talking to me. After I went off, colleges reached out. I ended up committing to the, go to the University of Virginia. So I go to the University of Virginia the next year in 2005, and I thought everything that I had gone over um, basically that senior year and, and applied and learned and grew, I thought it was like riding a bike. I trained my mindset for a while. I'm good. But it's just like the physical side. What we don't use, we lose. If we don't use it, we lose it. And it seemed like I lost everything. I go to UVA that first year, on and off the field. I almost get kicked off the team. I let the college life get to me. And I am just back where I was those first three years of high school. And so it took me that whole first year of just struggling, of struggling to finally at the end of the year having surgery. And that's when I determined this is when I need to recommit. I need to recommit to the mental side of things, not just on the field, but off the field because everything was struggling. So I did that, and sophomore year and junior year at the University of Virginia, it was kind of like that senior year at, at Herndon High School in 2004. That, that player, that person came back. And I went off those two years, uh, was fortunate, like Tyler said, I became a Hall of Fame baseball player there, but more so, I became just what I like to think the, the best version of me as a person. And I firmly believe that the, the, the better you any athlete or just anyone in general, the better they are off the field, the way better they will be on the field. So that's what I was very proud of. I got drafted and go to the Chicago Cubs in 2007. And, and at that time, I really believed that I had trained my mindset so well, I'm going to continue to do it. I am good, no matter what. Two years into the minor leagues, back in 2009, I had the worst year of my life playing-wise, worst year of my life. I go out there, and I'm like, I am doing everything right. Like, what is happening? So the key that really got me through that, because that would have been the end of my journey playing baseball, without a doubt. I was in what, double A in the minor leagues. After 200 at-bats, for those familiar with baseball, I was hitting 190. So I wasn't even hitting my weight. So I was pretty much rock bottom when it came to playing. But from my prior years, I learned if I just stick to the process, first have a process, know what really helps me show up at my best, and I stick to it, I will come out of this. And this is a, a cycle. I like to call it, there's two cycles that we all inevitably are going to go through in life. Cycle number one, it's, it's called the suffering cycle. We fall, and we have this adversity or challenge or obstacle that we're all going to have. We fall. But instead of learning from it and growing from it, we rise the same or weaker, and we're in that cycle way longer. That's what I was my first three years at high school. That's what I was my first year at University of Virginia. Now, the other cycle, I like to call it a growth cycle. That cycle, that, that inevitable fall, that failure, that adversity, that struggle comes, doing all we can to learn from it and, and persist during it, and then we rise stronger than we were before. That cycle doesn't last nearly as long, and when it does happen, you come out better than you were. Um, so I knew that, because I went through a lot of those suffering cycles, and a couple of the growth cycles, I was like, although this is the worst I've been playing, these are the worst numbers, this could be the end of my career, I'm just gonna stick to it. I know if I do, I will get out the other side. Stuck to it, that very next year, I won the Cubs Minor League Player of the Year Award, and if I did not do it, if I didn't approach it with what I like to call a warrior mindset, if I had been that victim like I definitely was earlier in my career, I would not be here talking to you all right now. That is for sure. Because what I like to think is a warrior finds a way, a victim finds excuses. And when I was younger, I was that victim way too much. And that's something we'll talk about, that, that true warrior mindset off the field is what's going to get us through those inevitable cycles that we will all go through. Um, so after that year, 
I get traded to the Tampa Bay Rays in 2011. Now, I grew up in the Northern Virginia, um, DC, Maryland, Virginia area. That next year, when I got traded to the Rays, I, two months later, I get called up to go to the big leagues. This is in 2011. I get called up, and it just so happened, where I got called up was Camden Yards, the Baltimore Orioles. So I got to go, all my family and friends are there, my big league debut. I go out there, Tyler mentioned it, I became the 108th player all time to hit a home run in the first big league at bat. But what he didn't mention is I struck out the next two times, <laughs> and I got sent down the next day. So it was just like a microcosm of everything, highs and lows, highs and lows. But so I did that, I get sent down, the rest of the year in the minor leagues. I got that taste of the big leagues. Great, I'm ready. I finished the minor league season very good. The next year in 2012, I was ready to make the team out of, out of spring training and just start my big league career and just have what I just imagined was gonna be just this amazing big league career. But then 2012 happened. 2012 happened. So I'm in spring training that year, having a good spring training, thinking I'm going to make the team. And then, um, yeah, I lend, this is down in Florida, I lend my car to a teammate. And this teammate decides to go on a rampage. He gets drunk, he gets in three, not one, three hit and runs. He runs over a motorcyclist, almost kills him. And I bring this up because in the state of Florida, if it's your car, you're liable. So I got sued, even though I wasn't in the car and had no idea what he was doing, I got sued for $10 million. And at that time, I'm in the minor leagues making $10,000 a year. I don't have anywhere near that, but they can get future earnings. So safe to say that just weighed on me. My only true outlet was on the baseball field. But at the beginning of that season, I didn't make the big league team. I had season-ending shoulder surgery. So when I say I was rock bottom on and off the field, 2012, that was me. Season-ending surgery, I can't get my mind off of what's going on off the field by playing baseball because my season's over. And then I'm getting, in the back of my mind, it's like, no matter you know, how much money I make, I'm getting sued for 10 million. I'm gonna have to give these people money. And I had nothing to do with it, nothing to do with it. And um, so that, that was another one of those cycles, another one of those cycles. And you know, up to that, to that point, while I've been through a lot of those cycles, both growth and suffering, um, you know, I just did not handle it like I needed to, like I should have. So it lasted a lot longer and the season was just not great at all. That year was not good at all. But it took me that off season, kind of like the off season of my first year at UVA, to recommit. To recommit and to recommit to being all in on becoming the best version of me. Not, I wasn't even thinking about a player. I was thinking out of a person, as a person to get out of that hole I was in. And so I did that. 13, 14 ended up being great years for me. I get to the big leagues. I stay there. So I play with the Rays for three years. Then I get traded in 2016 to the Tampa, uh, from the Tampa Bay Rays to the Cleveland Indians. And that, that was in the middle of the season. And that goes with, I'm telling you, when I say anxiety and you know, all these other kind of emotions, you're in a set place. You've been there for a long time. I have a wife and two kids at the time. In the middle of the year, I have to like, pick up everything and go meet a new team, meet all these new teammates, move my family from Florida to Cleveland. And once again, if I had not up to that point been training my mindset in an intentional way, there's no way I would have been able to be that part of that championship team that lost in game seven of the 2016 World Series of the Chicago Cubs. But because of all that training I had done, both on and off the field, I was equipped, I was ready to handle all that anxiety, all that failure, all the challenges that were coming that year. Um, so very, very thankful for that. And once again, that's the power of the mind. And that's what it can do. Um, whether we're playing sports or we're just going through, through life. Um, next three years, I am with the Cleveland Indians. And then in 2020, COVID hits when I was in spring training with the uh, San Francisco Giants. And at that point, I'm just coming off my second elbow surgery. And right then, I realized this is probably the end for me when they set us home from spring training because I, I knew what I wanted to do the next chapter of my life. And the next chapter of my life is what I'm doing now, is what I'm doing with Major League Mindset, taking that journey of adversity, that gauntlet that we all go through. I wanted to take that and now give back to not just athletes, but people um, of all ages. And so that's really what brought me here today. And I'm sure if I were to ask you all, what's a common theme you notice? 
It's at every step of the way, starting in high school and even before that, but really in high school, there's just adversity, failure, struggles, mentally, physically. Um, but, but I truly believe that those are our partners in growth. They're not our enemies. If we can really approach that and really go at it with this mindset, that warrior mindset, and three words you'll hear me say later is bring it on. If we can get to the point where we say bring it on to all of that stuff, well, then we are ready to handle it, and we approach it differently. We don't avoid it. And then what does it do? Well, it makes you harder. And this road that we're all on for life, no matter what we're doing, no matter what profession, there's zigs, there's zags, there's bends, there's a lot of uphill, there's a lot of potholes. It's hard. This road is hard that we're on. But if we put the work in, we can be harder, without a doubt. So that's really what it is. And as I'll say later, it's not supposed to be easy. It's supposed to be challenging. For if we're truly after and chasing down that best version of us, no matter what we're doing, we have to know it's going to be challenging. And if we are up for that battle, that's when we have this better sense of joy and flourishing, okay? We can build mental muscle just like physical muscle. It's a process, it takes time and effort, but the more you work on the inside, I promise you, the more it shows on the outside. And you're given that key, like I talked about, that senior year of high school, you're given a key, and that key literally helps you chip away at what's in the way, something we'll talk about, to, to sculpt that best version of you and get to that masterpiece inside, and then, then we're off. That doesn't mean we don't have our lows, we still do, but those lows are higher, and then our highs are higher. Um, and that's truly what it's all about. So I want you to keep that in mind, and hopefully, before we get into these four principles, you're starting to understand the importance of the mindset and what it can do for how you show up on a daily basis for yourself and for everybody else. So let's get into those four principles. And, and remember, four principles that completely, when I was at the lowest of lows, transformed my life. And I strongly believe if you all can start to apply them and really for yourself and for others and just create ripples, it can be huge. And I'm so grateful for the mentors and coaches um, when it came to the mental side of, of things that I had in life, because th that's who taught me this. And also what taught me this is I've gotten into Stoic philosophy um, through the years. And principle one, play the ultimate game. Speaking of Stoic philosophy, let's go, let's all get in a time travel machine. A quick story here that I learned and really stuck with me. Let's all get in a time travel machine. Let's go back thousands of years, and let's talk to the ancient Greek philosophers, such as Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, um, Aristotle, and the man who taught them all, Epictetus. Let's ask them, hey, what is the ultimate purpose of life? If we go back thousands of years and ask them what the ultimate purpose of life is, they would all tell us the ultimate purpose of life is to become the best version of you, but do so in service to something bigger than you, in service to your family, your friends, school, community, just the world at large. They would say that's the ultimate purpose of life. That's a solemn bolum. That's what they called that, okay? Now, let's come back, get in that time travel machine, come back to present day. Let's talk to positive psychologists. Let's talk to thought leaders and ask them, hey, what's the ultimate purpose of life? So we went thousands of years, we're back to present day. Such as, let's talk to Martin Seligman, um, Caroline Adams Miller, um, all of the great Tal Ben-Shahar, all of the great positive psychologists and thought leaders of today. And we can ask them, what's the ultimate purpose of life? They would tell us all the same thing. The ultimate purpose of life is to become the best version of you in service to something bigger than you. Really, live your best life, put the work in to live your best life, and help others do the same. So across all time, everyone says that. They say that's the true ultimate purpose of life. So I like to put a twist on it. I like to put a twist on it, and I say, let's play the ultimate game of life. And I call the ultimate game closing the gap. And that gap is who you are capable of being at any given moment and who you are actually being. Trust me when I say I know what it's like to have this gap wide. And when this gap is wide, you're capable of this, but you're actually being this. In this gap, is anxiety, is fear, is worry, is shame, is doubt, is depression. Because we can be this, but we're actually being this. That gap is wide. And a lot of times it's because we don't necessarily have the mindset or mental skills needed. 
We, it's our habits that we've created. It's our behaviors. Um, it's our lifestyle. We're capable of this, but we're actually being this. If we can, in any given moment, close that gap, well, there's absolutely no room for that icky stuff that I just talked about when we close that gap, okay? Now, it's easier said than done. And the key caveat to this is we will never be perfect with it. So never perfectly, but more and more consistently, you closing the gap. Now, why is that important? A couple reasons. I firmly believe that the more, I said it earlier, the more well-rounded you are as an individual, the better suited you are in life to handle all the failure, all the pressure, all the challenges, all the stress that's coming all of our way. No matter who we are, no one is exempt. That's coming all of our way. But when we develop mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, well, we have what it takes to handle that, and those times don't affect us nearly as much. So that's the first reason why. The second reason why is because you accumulate the ultimate or the number one currency in life. And I learned this from the great Tal Ben-Shahar, positive psychologist. Him and many others call the number one currency in life happiness. And, they, and this has been something that's been studied nonstop. They say that you know, it's a losing proposition, and this used to be me, when you are simply chasing results or chasing success or chasing fame or chasing popularity or chasing social media followers. That's a losing proposition, thinking that's going to make us happy. This is what so many studies have proven. They say you're happy first, and then you are successful at a very high level. Okay, so we want to be intrinsically motivated. Intrinsic, intrinsically motivated means intrinsically motivated to be the best you, to create meaningful relationships, and to be, you know, positively contribute to, to the community. That's intrinsically motivated. And then the great thing happens. We, when we do that, we collect that number one currency in life. And then as a byproduct, all that extrinsic stuff, all the results and outcomes we're after, all the goals we're after, the dreams we have, you know, all that stuff that's not really in our control, it comes our way as a byproduct. And, and we'll talk about a next principle. If we want what's out of our control in life, we have to be absolutely excellent with what's in our control. And the great thing is we can control that, and it's a skill. It's a skill that can be developed and cultivated. All right, so first reason why it's very important to play that ultimate game. The more well-rounded you are, the better, better suited you will be. And then number two, you collect that ultimate currency in life. And the number one way I firmly believe, and science backs this up, to collect that number one currency of happiness is through an attitude of gratitude. And of everything we talk about, gratitude might be up there with the really close to the foundation of all things mental strength, gratitude. When you really take time to appreciate and celebrate everything big and small in your life, blessings, gifts, accomplishments, people, struggles, um, and, and really taking all of those as granted, taking all of them with gratitude, not for granted, because when we really take time to appreciate what we have, well, those things appreciate. When we don't do that, well, things depreciate in our lives, okay? So we really want to take time to appreciate all that we have, cultivate this attitude of gratitude, and then we are happier. But more importantly, when we do that, our perspective changes. And our perspective is how we see ourselves, our perspective is how we see the world around us, different situations, different events, when that perspective changes, and we're like putting on these bright lenses, and we're seeing all the good in situations, all the good in people, all the good in the things in our lives, our life completely change, changes. We now show up with a different energy about us. We feel it, everyone else feels it, and then the inevitable struggles that come our way, they don't affect us nearly as much, because we have a different perspective on things, and we appreciate what we have with this attitude of gratitude because we've cultivated and, and we've accumulated that number one currency in life of happiness. We become that psychological billionaire, which once again, we accumulate that. All of the other stuff, fame, wealth, that many people are after, well, it comes as a byproduct. Science has proven, though, that when you're simply chasing that, stuff, that extrinsic stuff, which, trust me, I have been there. I have been there. Even if you get it, they say you're less psychologically stable than you if you were simply motivated to become the best you, and then that stuff comes your way. 
So if you want to get those extrinsic results and you want to enjoy the process along the way and be happier, well, that's the way to do it. It's really, once again, about closing that gap. And now, this is all good and all, but what, you know, how? How do you close the gap? So I have one word for you, arete. So it's a Greek word. It's a Greek word, if you Google it, it means excellence. But I've come to learn over the years, it means to express that best version of yourself moment to moment to moment. Once again, never perfectly, but more and more consistently. And it stuck with me so much that I wanted to put it on somewhere where I could always have a reminder that when I'm feeling off, I'm not feeling connected to the best me, which happens all the time because I'm not perfect. No one here will be the first perfect person. It's going to happen. I put it on my forum right here to be that constant reminder. So when I'm home with my family, now that I'm not playing anymore, and I don't feel like I'm being that patient father or husband that I need to be, what do I do? I simply look at it, touch it, and take, the, take a deep breath and embody what I like to call the best version of me. And that right there, this word, completely changed my life. And it literally is, if you were to go back thousands of years ago and ask the ancient philosophers or modern day positive psychologists, how do you play the ultimate game? How do you have that ultimate purpose in life and be great with it? They'll give you a one word answer, arate. They'll give you a one word answer. It's very powerful. Um, so to live with arate, which means live with excellence, live by expressing the best version of you, well, we have to know who we are at our best, okay? We have to have this true sense of self, of identity, really tune in, become our own best friends, get to know ourselves very well, this mindfulness, this self-awareness. And self-awareness is simply getting to know who you are at your best, but also who you are at your worst. Because we all have that best and worst inside of us battling all day, every day. So it's great to get to know both of them so you understand and you have that, you're mindful when that worst version is trying to take over because it's going to for all of us, okay? So the self-awareness, because what we're aware of, obviously we can change. What we're unaware of, we cannot. So two questions that really any player or person I work with, trying to help them get great clarity in. Giving them this identity. Who are you at your best? Really help them get to know who are you at your best? And we name it, like I'll show you. And then... What are the qualities you embody that help you show up at your best? And what are the behaviors you engage in that do the same? And then like Tom Brady said, more good, less bad. When Tom Brady was asked, what would he tell his younger self? He, say, he said, I would just tell him to do more of the good and do less of the bad. Know what helps me show up at my best on and off the field. Do more of the good, do less of the bad. So it can become quite simple, not easy, but it becomes simple. Once we can answer those two questions very, very well. So identity, if you were to Google it and look it up, identity literally means repeated beingness. And it's a powerful thing, but it goes both ways because we can repeatedly be a mediocre, a pretty good version of ourselves. And mediocre literally means middle of the mountain. We can be that, or we can strive, not perfectly, but we can strive to be the best version of us. And that's our identity. It all depends what you're repeatedly being. And when we are repeatedly being that best version of us, well, then our values and our behaviors guide our lives, not our feelings. Those first three years, and even on and off throughout my life, it was the feelings, how I felt at a certain time or moment that determined how I acted. But if we can get to the point where we have an actions over feelings mindset, where we just know what we do, and we do those behaviors, whether we feel like it or not, another way to quickly change your life. A book I highly recommend for everybody here is James Clear's Atomic Habits. And when it comes to identity, this really hits home. So he says, rather than starting with what we want to achieve and how we're going to get there, we need to think about who we are committed to becoming. That's the engine that drives the creation of the best habits and the destruction of the worst. Who we are committed to becoming. And then another amazing book that's not just for athletes. It's called The Mindful Athlete by George Mumford. He was the mental toughness coach for Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, Michael Jordan, and a lot of other people, all walks of lives. He says, when Michelangelo was asked how he created his masterpieces, he replied that all he did was chip away to get to the masterpiece that was already inside. I believe we're all chipping away to get to that masterpiece. So it comes back to, let's sculpt out that best version of us. 
And when I heard this a while ago, it really stuck home is, let's bring a flashlight and a hammer to the party. A lot of times when we're going through life, we bring a hammer, and when we're not living up to our expectations or we're just not feeling good, we bash ourselves, we shame ourselves. We're not kind to ourselves. I've been there a lot. But we want to bring a flashlight first and shine it on what needs work in our lives. What can we do? What changes, big and small, can we make? And then once we notice what needs work, we build up that self-awareness. We're very mindful. Well, then we bring a hammer. And that hammer is to sculpt that best version. That hammer is to change our habits and our behaviors. It's a very, very powerful process. If you can really think about less shaming, but more just what can I do right now in this moment to live with arte and to close that gap. It becomes a very powerful process for all of us. And to do that, it's all about having this strong identity. So I always like this, when I'm working with athletes, we do on and off the field. And it's three tiers. So at the top, we actually name it. Give their identity, like literally give it a name. Who are you at your best? And I'll show you an example in the next slide. And then, what are three qualities, or what are three words that when you are just, you know you're your best, they describe you? Like if you were really to think about it, what are three words that describe you? If I were to tell you mine, I would say disciplined, I would say bold, and I would say loving. Those are the three words that I know when I'm at my best, I'm embodying those qualities or virtues. Am I always that? Nope, definitely not. But it's when I'm not that and I know who I am at my not so good, I've, you know, over time become very mindful and great with recognizing the tendencies of that worst self inside of me. And that might be one of the most important things we can ever talk about and that we, I will talk about today is being mindful. When that worst self voice and attitude and habits and behaviors and you know, mostly self-talk is taking over and you're shaming yourself, you're ruminating in your own thoughts, a spiral starts and you just don't take control and it keeps spiraling. It's in those moments, it's not the next day, it's in that moment, can you do something? Can you have a tool to reconnect to that best version of you in the moment? So that gap starts to wide, can you have awareness of it and do something about it in the moment? That's where it becomes life changing, but we have to know, once again, who are we at our best? So you'll see right here, off the field, off the field. This player right here, it was a couple years ago, he said, Brandon, on the field, I'm a world-class athlete, great. Off the field, a world-class person. So when I am off the field, literally everything I think about is how can I be right now in integrity with someone who is a world-class person? He picked his qualities. Fun, generous, grateful, loving, present, and kind. That's when he knows he's at his best. And then what are his top behaviors? As you can see there, his top behaviors. Once we start this process and really get the awareness and understanding of who we are at our best, I, I truly believe we're 80% of the way there. But a lot of us, and I certainly did until, you know, I got a little older, I had no idea. So things happen by chance. Instead of, you know, knowing that chance favors the prepared and knowing what I did at my best and, and engaging in those habits and behaviors. I call it the be, do, have mindset. I heard this a long time ago, and it's great. So let's think about a be, do, have mindset. Be, be that best version of you. That I have that strong identity. And let's be that version of you that leads to you doing those strong, empowering behaviors for yourself and others. And then that's going to lead to those results in you having what you all want in life, having the life you want to live. But when I was younger and struggling, it was that that I led guide me throughout my life. It was the results that I was after that led me to very weak behaviors and absolutely no identity. Okay, so we want to have this strong identity. This is who I am at my best. Be that version of you. Engage in the behaviors that lead to that version showing up consistently, whether it's less screen time, whether it's nine hours in bed every night, whether it's eating better, whether it's moving, whether it's mindfulness training and meditation. Think about for you all, what is it that you do if you were to think about the past 90 days. What did you do on your best days? Because then we can get very clear on, man, I had a great day there. Okay, what did you do? And then let's just do it more and more consistently. That's what it's all about. And once again, it's not easy. It's not easy, but we can make it simple. And I put hashtag act as if. 
This is another principle that has been studied nonstop throughout the years. Scientists, they call it act as if principle. You act as if you are that best version of you, you become it. You act it and you become it. We're not talking fake it. We're talking you know who you are at your best, and then you act that way and carry yourself that way and engage in those behaviors, you become it. But once again, it goes the other way. If you're acting and living like an average or pretty good version of you, that's what you become. So let's keep that in mind. I'm going to get to know myself very well, who I am at my best, then I'm going to act that way, not perfectly, but more and more consistently, then I will become it. Super, super powerful and empowering. Um, so let's play the ultimate game. Once again, one word to do that is arete. It means excellence, but the deeper definition. It means to live by expressing that best version of yourself so that in any given moment, when the inevitable str struggles and failure and adversity comes our way, and that gap starts to widen between who you're capable of being and who you're actually being, taking control and closing that gap as quickly and as best as you can, knowing it's going to widen again, that worst self is going to try to come out again, but then in the moment doing something so you can close that gap. That's how you more and more consistently show up at your best for yourself and for others. Um, principle number two, control the controllables. So I like to think of it as the number one skill in life. Now, we, and this is like an ancient stoic kind of their principle or thought is we don't control much of what happens in our life, but we always control how we respond to it. We always control. There's only so much that we can control in our life. Okay, so no matter what happens to us, we can always control how we respond to it. And we want to just know that and believe it and know that this is a skill. This isn't something that you're just born with and you're great. You can cultivate this throughout the day. Anytime things happen to you that you have no control over, whether it's traffic, you get cut off, someone says something to you, um, someone at work does something, someone, a teacher does something, a friend does something, a kid does something, Realize that you can't control that, but you can control how you respond to it. And then in your response lies the outcomes that you want, okay? And it lies the outcomes, good or bad. That's the power of controlling what we can control. So I created an acronym, R-E-A-P. And R-E-A-P, I picked that because you reap the benefits. When you're not just good, but you are great with controlling the controllables. Literally, you will have more fun You'll be happier, you'll have more confidence, you'll feel less stress, you'll feel less pressure, and you'll go through life free and loose with that great sense of freedom. Okay, so R-E-A-P. Question out there, anyone know any words that start with R that are 100% in your control? Who said that? Reaction? Yes, thank you. Reactions and responses. What about E? Words that start with E, 100% in your control. Emotions, yep. Any others? Express. express. Did you say express? Yeah. Yes, great. Anything else? Empathy, Empathy. great. Effort. Effort. Your energy. What about A? Words that start with A, 100% in your control. Yeah, action. Actions, attitude. Another one I like to say is appearance, and that meaning your body language. A great book I highly recommend to all of you all is Presence. Presence. It's, I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on the, Amy Cuddy. If you look at Amy Cuddy, and she had a TED Talk, it's I think the second most TED, watched TED Talk of all time. All she's really talking about is presence and your body language, how it can create power and confidence in your life. Um, highly recommend that book. It's a game changer. Um, by simply how you carry yourself in your overall presence. Okay, P. Where does it start with P, 100% in your control? Perspective? Is that what you said, perspective? Yes. Perspective? Preparation? Process? Present moment focus? Okay, so R E A P. We got those. Reap. And not just be good. Let's do our best to be great with those. Now, obviously, there's a lot more out of our control in life. And what I think that we all tend to, I definitely did when I was younger and still do in my not-so-great times, is think about the thoughts, opinions, and decisions of others. We let that give us tension, worry, doubt, stress. We tend to think about, more so than what's in our control, we think about 
what's out of our control, especially the thoughts, opinions, and decisions of others. But we can't control that. So literally, it gets to the point where like, if we know deep down we have no control over so much in life, but we always control how we respond to that, and it's in our response that is going to determine our confidence, our happiness, and our success in life, no matter what we're doing, then that's why I firmly believe it becomes the number one skill in life to not just be good once again, but to be great with it, okay? And I think one of the most important things that's 100% in our control is our self-talk, is our self-talk. As Shad Helmstetter, another great book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. He says, the brain simply believes what you tell it most, and what you tell it about you, it will create. It has no choice. And we are programmed as humans over time as we've evolved to have, I think it's 74% of our thoughts, if we're not careful, are negative. We're programmed to think that way. It's called negativity bias. So if we aren't careful and take control of our thoughts, then it's going to be way, way more negative, and that's going to lead to the behaviors and habits that we don't necessarily want. So I like to think of it, as I mentioned earlier, we all have the best and the worst inside us battling all day, every single day. No matter who you are, no matter how much you trained your mindset, no matter how good of a person you are, your best and your worst is battling. So think of it like the two wolves, good, bad, positive, negative, loving, hateful, fearful, courageous. We all have those two wolves battling. And now, what determines which one wins is the one you feed and also the ones you starve. So we want to take control of our self-talk, and that's how we do it. And a great tool to help you with that are having specific mantras that work for you. And a mantra equals tool of the mind. We probably all heard the word mantra. Mantra means tool of the mind. So having set tools you can go to, once again, in the moment, when things happen, gaps widening, things aren't going good for us, we're all going to experience it, can we go to a tool? Think of a mental tool as something you can go to to change your mental state in the moment. Mental state is your attitude, it's your focus, it's your self-talk, it's your body language. If you have something you can go to to take control in the moment, it's a game changer, it's a life changer. And so the wristband I gave you guys today, everyone here, is to help you with that. Now, these are set mantras of all the thousands of players that have been through the program. I asked them, what are your favorite mantras on, but also most importantly, off the field that you can go to to help you in the moment? So number one, they picked Arte. We already went over the importance of that. Breathe was number two. Remembering to use their breath. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The third one was ohms. That means obstacles make me stronger. When we can approach failure and adversity in tough times as, thank you, universe, you're giving me an obstacle that's going to make me stronger, and we approach it that way, and we perceive it that way, well, then that's what happens, okay? And then we have that growth cycle and not that suffering cycle like I talked about. So a true ohms mindset, very powerful. Bring it on. These are three of the most powerful words you could ever say to yourself. When you are approaching adversity, when you're stepping out of your comfort zone, when you feel fear or anxiety, all these emotions that we all have, these three words have been scientifically proven to change how you respond psychologically and physiologically. It changes everything. Bring it on. When you are facing tough times or you're doing something out of your comfort zone, I highly, highly recommend you say those words to yourself. Let me give you an example for me on the field. When in game seven of the 2016 World Series, I'm going up, I'm on deck, in the bottom of the eighth, of what I know is about to be the biggest at-bat of my life, millions of people watching on TV, about to face one of the best pitchers in the world. Did I have anxiety? Without a doubt. Was my heart racing? 100%. Did I have that high arousal on my body? 100%. But I learned throughout the years, it's all about how I perceive those feelings in the body. We can either look at it like a threat, like, oh God, well, why is this happening? This is not good. Or we can look at it with this challenge response, and say, good, thank you, body. You're giving me the energy to perform right now. And so I said that, and I said literally out loud, nonstop, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on. I rolled as Chapman was pitching. I said, bring it on, Chapman, literally as I'm walking to the plate. So instead of going up to the plate, which I used to do all the time in those moments, being tense and tight and worried that I might not come through with this big sense and fear of failure, in that moment, I go up there, biggest at-bat of my life, 
and I'm just smiling. It's like, oh, my God, I'm, I'm more free and loose than I've ever been in this moment. And obviously, no matter what we're doing in life, that doesn't mean success. It doesn't guarantee anything, but it guarantees you're putting yourself, whether it's for an interview or a tough conversation or whatever it is, you're putting yourself in the best position to succeed. And then whatever happens, happens. You just can do your part and put yourself in the best position. It just so happened in that at bat, I hit a line drive double to right center field. And really, uh, you could change the trajectory of my life. Um, that single at bat. But it was what went through, what I did mentally and said to myself that changed everything. And that's where having that mantra right there, bring it on. With whatever you're doing in life, I promise you, it can make, make such an impact. On the other side, win. That means what's important now? Going through life, it's literally the number one question we could ever ask ourselves. What's important now? Things aren't going my way. I'm frustrated. That gap's widening. What's important now? Because if we don't ask that, then those things continue to happen. But if we stop, and it's called targeted thinking. This is a very, very, very powerful tool for anybody. Targeted thinking. You ask yourself two questions. What do I want? Okay, things aren't going good. What do I want? Literally, like wave a magic wand. What do I want right now? What do I need to do to get what I want? It becomes a very two very empowering questions. So remember that. What's important now? Kiss. That simply means keep it simple, stud. Go through life. Keep it simple. Keep it simple, stud. Keep it simple. No matter what you're doing, we, I know we all tend to overthink at times. You find yourself overthinking. Hey, let's just keep it simple. Keep it simple right here. And then pitch one. Now, that's more for athletes, but I'll tell you how I got it. So Jeff Bezos at Amazon, every day, he tells his employees it's day one. He said, I don't care, or he always says, I don't care what happened yesterday, good or bad. I don't care what could happen tomorrow, good or bad. Today is day one. What can you do for yourself and for the company and your family today? In the present moment, not thinking about the past or worried about the future, what can you do today? He says that every day is day one. So I put a twist on, I said pitch one. So for all player, baseball players, every pitch you're up there, you're hitting, whatever you're doing, it's pitch one. You strike out your last five at bats, we're not thinking about the past. We're not worried about what the future could hold. We're right here, right now, where our feet are in the present moment. And whatever we're doing in life, when we can be in the present moment, whatever we're looking to execute or have success with has its best chance to do just that. So we want to really focus on how can I get to the present moment. Um, so whatever you feel inspired to do with those wristbands, I like to hand them out. But once again, say none of those mantras work for you. Remember, mantra means tool of the mind. What I would recommend is you start to think about what is a mantra that could be great for you? And another way to look at it, I call, and this is a great tool, it's called a one-word focus. You literally have one word that is at the top of your mind all, of the, all the time. When you start to feel the frustration, you know, the bad attitude, getting emotional, all that stuff starts to happen, you can have this word to go to. And one of the most powerful words you can pick is gratitude. Another one's presence. Whatever has meaning for you, have a word that, man, that gap's widening. You can do something to change your mental state in the moment. It's called a one-word focus. Once again, if you have these tools, think of a toolbox. You have a couple tools to go through life with. If and when you get knocked down, you fall short, you struggle, then we can go to those tools to change our mental state in the moment. All right, principle number three, dominate the fundamentals. If I were to ask you all, what do you all think is the number one virtue most highly correlated with our flourishing and with our overall well-being and happiness? What have positive psychologists determined is the number one virtue for that? Does anyone have a guess? Think of virtue, think of quality. What do you think is the number one positive psychologists right now today say is most highly correlated with us feeling our best and living our best life? Anyone have a guess? Routines? It's part of it. That's what leads to this. Okay. Mindset, very important. Yes, that leads to it. So they say the number one virtue most highly correlated with our well-being and success, they call it zest. They say zest. It might be a surprise to some of you, but zest is another way to think of energy. Energy mentally and physically becoming more fit than you've ever been so you can serve yourself and serve others. 
over the years, I've really found out and realized, you know, with the, who, the, um, the trainers and coaches and mentors I've had, all the research I've done, and the work I've done the past four years since retiring, that getting our energy to world-class levels, get the, the best we can, is the number one lever for success in life. And I think it goes like this. We become more energized as we can be mentally and physically. Our perspective shifts. We're then happier, and then we get the results we want. Because you all, I'm sure, would agree, when you had a good night of sleep, when you're just feeling vibrant and alive and energized, your perspective on things is way different. And when that perspective is different, like we talked about earlier, you're accumulating that number one currency in life, which they say is happiness. And then when we have that, that's been proven to lead to results, not the other way around. So that's where I firmly believe, and many others do too, this isn't just me, science has proven it. Once again, it's the number one virtue, they say, most highly correlated with our success and with our happiness, energy. So I came up with five fundamentals, I call it MLM fundamentals, to become more energized than ever. It's eating, sleeping, training, breathing, and self-discipline. I'm not going to go in depth on all of them, but just know that, think of it as you're building this strong foundation. And when you have this strong foundation, well, then you climb up that ladder of success much easier. Okay, then the inevitable. When we are as energized as possible, when the inevitable failures and adversity and struggles come all of our way, they don't affect us nearly as much. We can handle them much better. So eating, sleeping, training, breathing, and self-discipline. I like to call it major league sleeping. Quick story about this. My rookie year with the Tampa Bay Rays. And I, up until this point, I was probably 25 at the time. I had the mindset, I want to, I'm just going to do everything I can to make the most of my God-given ability. And in 2011, sleep wasn't talked about a lot. So they brought in a sleep expert from Stanford. And in this meeting, she blew our minds away. She went over these studies with athletes that you would definitely know and how it's changed their life on and off the field. And so I remember leaving that meeting and I said, I am going to not just start out working and all this stuff, the competition. I'm going to start out sleeping the competition. I'm going to approach sleep like it's a sport and be very intentional with it. So ways to do that, because I, I think sleep is, the number, is one of the top levers you can pull for your overall well-being. Okay, so... In bed, nine to 10 hours, trust me, I have three young kids at home, it's very hard, but if we are intentional with our time, we are efficient with our time, maybe we get closer, maybe we get to that eight to 10 hours of sleep that is recommended. Number two might be the most important. Remember Dr. Chris Winter, he was our sleep doctor with the Cleveland Indians. He nonstop said this, 30, 30 to 60 minutes before you go to bed, let's put away electronics. If you wanna put some blue blocker glasses on, do that. Think of when we're on our phone, especially right until bed, and trust me, the phone can be my kryptonite too, but I try to be so aware of when I am getting carried away with it, but before bed, this thing is gone. When I'm around my family, it's in a drawer just so I can be very present and connected, and that's a whole other story, but when we, when we are scrolling and on our phone, well, it's just like when we're eating, our body has to digest that food. When we're doing it before bed and we're going, all that stimulation and input, well, what happens? We don't get near the quality sleep that we need. And it's probably gonna make it harder to fall asleep or maybe if you wake up in the middle of the night, it's hard to fall back asleep. So that's where the sleeping, if you can pull this lever and just increase your quality of sleep, I'm telling you, how you show up drastically changes. And then having a good sleep environment is another way to do just that. Now, one of the fundamentals is called breath. Your, br your breath, I like to call it a big league breath. And this is the, I always like to say, Connecting to the best within you, centering, centering yourself, and really gaining self-control is always one breath away. Always one breath away. A lot of people take their breath for granted, though. They're not intentional with it. But I'm telling you, if you really start to think of, especially when you are at this highly emotional and frustrated state that we all get to, when you're there, if you can be mindful and aware of taking a breath, then I'm telling you, you will go from that highly emotional, frustrated state to a grounded, present kind of sense of calm, confident state. And it is a very powerful state to be in. And this wristband right here, you can't read it from where you are, but it says breathe. So when I was playing in the, in the playoffs heading into the World Series, I had known that the, my, using my breath was the number one tool I could ever go to in high stressful and anxiety moments. So I had the guy write stitch breathe in there. 
So it became, when I was playing, I'd be wearing it. I would constantly look at it, close my eyes, take that deep breath. I had this, another tool that could be great for you all. I call it a flip the switch routine. Know who you are at your best, and then when you don't feel connected to that version of you that it's going to happen for all of us, you literally, you picture a, a, a light switch and you flipping it on and you just in the moment becoming that best version of you. It's very powerful to do it in the moment. So that's what I would do when I played. That's the big league breath and it's a big part of mindfulness, training mindfulness. And a technique I would really recommend to all of you all to try if you've never done it, it's called BALL, B-A-L-L. So it's breath work. You start with that to get your mind very present and quiet and to slow everything down. Breath work, I like to always think of box breathing. So when you're box breathing, you're thinking of a little box. You're inhaling for a certain amount of time. You're holding for a certain amount of time. You're exhaling for a certain amount of time. Then you're holding for a certain amount of time. Very, very powerful. It's actually what Navy SEALs do before they go into battle. Um, fun fact. Major League Meditation. So the meditation part of it, I like to think of, there's a couple ways you can go about it, but when you create, you have these affirmations that work for you, okay? Affirmations. So a lot of times I'll run players through this, and it'll be something along the lines of, I know the ultimate game in life and how to play it well. I am grateful for all the blessings in my life, both big and small. I will control what I can control and let go of what I can't. I will live in the present moment. I will use my breath to gain self-control. So kind of having affirmations like that, great for mindfulness. And then the two L's, look back and look forward. For this, as you see in the third worksheet right there that I had created, the visualization part is you looking at your best, when you showed up at your best in your past, so for athletes, when they showed up and they crushed it, and then looking forward planting the seeds for future success, looking forward. But when it comes to mindfulness and non-athletes, something great to do is after you do the breath work and you say some of the affirmations in your mind, you look back, you're nice and quiet and present at this time, you think of recently, what are moments, what are situations that really triggered you, that, you know, that, that gap started to widen, and you didn't respond like you know you can and know you should have. Really looking back and thinking about that and then looking forward. So B-A-L-L, -L, look forward. What can you do when those moments arise again? How can you more and more consistently step in when, when, that, the, when things happen to us out of our control, that event, that stimulus, how can we, because we talked about closing the gap, how can we step in and widen the gap between a stimulus and our response to it? Because if we can take a deep breath when things don't happen that, that are out of our control and respond like that best version of us, then the results, the outcomes we get come our way. So I want you to keep in mind, this is great for mindfulness, really becoming aware, knowing, getting to know yourself well, tuning in to yourself, becoming your own best friend, realizing what situations and moments and maybe people trigger you, and then in the future, what can you do when that stuff comes up again? Very empowering process right there. Um, the last fundamental is discipline. Discipline. And I want, there's three disciplines. I'm, we're probably running short on time, so I'm not going to go into all of them, but it's structural, reactive, and expansive discipline. But I want you to think of discipline as simply do what you need to do and do what you know is best for you, whether you feel like it or not. Because we're all going to have, and I heard this a long time ago, and it always stuck with me. We're all going to have two pains in life. We're going to have the pain of discipline, and the pain of discipline, though, that weighs ounces. If not, we're going to have the pain of regret, and that weighs tons, and that's with us for our, the rest of our lives. So you can almost think of, and I like the exercise, begin with the end in mind. Begin with you on your deathbed. Do you want the pain of discipline, which you know is ounces when you're on your deathbed, or do you want the pain of regret? When you begin with the end in mind, it can be a very, very powerful thing. So keep that in mind. We're going to have those two pains, and discipline and willpower is a skill we can develop, is a skill we can cultivate. So keep that in mind. Final principle, anti fragile Are we good with uh, time, Tyler? Uh, a bit okay, I'll go through this real quick. anti fragile confidence, this might be the most important principle, at least tied with play the ultimate game. I want you to imagine you're a box going through the mail, because this word, I'm going to explain anti fragile and confidence. You're a box going through the mail. That box is what it used to be on my box nonstop. It says fragile. 
Well, that tells the, the, the delivery guy, handle with care, breaks easily. It's not fun to go through life like that. That definitely was me. Any failure at a university, someone said something about me, I would break. Now, okay, we put the work in, develop our mindset, then you're, you're going through the mail as a box. It says resilient, resilient on it. What does that say to the delivery guy? Well, that says this person bounced back quicker than most, but I still like to think even if you're resilient, you could eventually break. So I say, why not go on the furthest end of the spectrum and have anti-fragile written on your box? Anti-fragile, literally, you're the opposite of fragile, and you're unbreakable. And at the end of the day, I think of it as the more you get kicked around, the more adversity you face, the stronger you get. That's anti-fragility, okay? Another way to think of anti-fragility is I want you to think of you're going through life like a candle. And trust me, I know what this is like. And a neutral force and a gust of wind comes. That gust of wind represents failure, anxiety, depression, fear, all that icky stuff. It's coming. What happens to a candle when a gust of wind comes? It gets extinguished. It blows out. Now, imagine we're going through life like a fire. You can be a candle or you can be a fire. And that same gust of wind comes. What does that do to a fire? It fuels it. So that's what we want to get to. Anything, any mindset coach or anything out there says, it's never going to make anxiety, fear, worry, doubt, stress, all that stuff magically disappear. It'll help you get to the point where you now eat it all up and use it as fuel because you're truly anti-fragile. So please keep that in mind, the power and importance of being anti-fragile. And the last thing, confidence. If you were to look up the word confidence, it means intense trust. It comes from a Latin word, con fidere. So confidence equals intense trust. And it's not an intense trust that I used to think it meant where you put the work in, you're a good person, that everything's going to go perfectly for you. It's an intense trust that you know deep down to your core, no matter what happens, you can handle it and you can respond powerfully to anything that comes your way in life. That's true, authentic confidence. Okay? So literally, anti-fragile confidence means unbreakable trust in yourself. Unbreakable trust in yourself. A couple of the top ways to get there, that ohms mindset. And really knowing deep down and accepting that life is supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be challenging. It's not going to be easy. When we really realize that, and three words, or one, two, four words, three things we're never exonerated from in life. Learn this from the great uh, psychologist Phil Stutz. We will never be exonerated, no matter who we are, no matter how much money we've made, no matter how successful or not we are, we'll never be exonerated from pain, uncertainty, and hard work in life. We will never be exonerated. There's no there there where you put in all this work, you're doing everything, and oh, I'm finally to a place where I'm not going to have to experience pain and uncertainty, and I'm not going to have to work very hard for what I want. So once I learned this and got this through my head, that no matter what, that's going to happen, so then when the inevitable pain came, well, great, it's part of the process. And I didn't beat myself up. I had this sense of self-compassion. And the leader in self-compassion, Kristen Neff, she talks about three keys to really have this good self-compassion for yourself. Number one is self-kindness. Self-kindness, talk to yourself like you're talking to your best friend or to a young child. Self-kindness. Number two, she termed the, the phrase common humanity. And she says, so common humanity, these two words really changed my life. It, really, it means just because you have fear or anxiety or depression and all this stuff happening, it doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It means you're a human being and it's a common human experience. So she said when this stuff, these thoughts and these, you know, adversity and all this stuff comes our way, the sense of common humanity. It's not something's wrong with me. Everyone goes through it. It's part of the process. And then the last part is mindfulness like we just talked about. Tuning in, becoming best friends with you, beginning to know yourself very well. That'll take your self-compassion up a whole nother level. This quote from the Dalai Lama has always stuck with me. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Kristen Neff has these equations. She says, pain times resistance, and resistance means when we have that adversity and pain in our life that's going to come our way, we respond negative, negatively to it. When we respond negatively to it, what happens? We have a lot of suffering. We have a lot of suffering. But if we accept it, 
like the top way to become anti-fragile, we accept whatever happens to us. We get to the point, like Kristen Neff calls it, love what is. No matter what happens, if you can get to the point where you love it, then nothing can really affect you. So you have that pain, you accept it, which is a positive response, you get that growth out of it. So if we can look at pain as frustrating and as hard as it can be, because trust me, I've been the lowest of lows. If we can look at it as pur purposeful, once again, we have a growth cycle rather than a suffering cycle. Talked about it earlier, things aren't always going to go our way. So when we fall short, we get knocked down, we can be that victim or we can be a warrior. When we are a victim, we find excuses. When we're a warrior, we find ways. Very, very important process. And once again, I, I don't know if any of you wrote this down, but this is a very, very powerful tool. Targeted thinking. Things aren't going your way. You're not happy. Two questions. What do I want? What do I need to do to get what I want? And then you simply take action. Um, doesn't mean it's easy, but you can simplify everything. Lastly, win or learn. Win or learn mindset. No matter what you're going into, you're trying to have success in. If you can have this true win or learn mindset and know you're going in as prepared as you can, if you have success, boom, be proud of yourself. That's like me. Or whatever you like to say, that's like me is very powerful to build up that self-image. But if you don't have success, another, I, I teach this to all athletes, you have bad games or whatever you're doing off the field, you don't have success, oh, that's not me. You protect that self-image. Things aren't going your way. You don't show up like, the, like you wanted to. That's not me. Things go your way. That's right. That's like me. Things don't. That's not me. Okay? So keep that in mind. Now, two of the most important words I'll say today, and we'll wrap it up with this, is emotional stamina. Emotional stamina simply means that the worse things are going for you and the worse you feel, the more committed you are to doing the things that you know help you show up at your best. Because if you're anything like me, when I was younger, the worse I felt, the less committed I was to doing those things. So the worse we feel, the more committed we are to doing what we know helps us show up at our best. Living in integrity with that identity, like I talked to you about earlier. Being the person that you want to be so you have strong behaviors and leading to what you want and what you're after in life. And I'll just wrap it up with my favorite quote of all time. Your thoughts determine what you want. Your actions determine what you get. Your thoughts determine what you want in life. Your actions determine what you get. Thank you.